So my name is Dan Walsh. I lead the container team at Red Hat. I um, basically, uh, she talked about Kubernetes under the covers or under the, the, under the hood. Well, I do what's under the hood of Kubernetes. So we do everything um, to do with running containers on the host level. Um, so I have under my team, there's probably about 20 or 30 engineers um, spread all across functional. So it's not just, I actually always worked in RHEL. I don't know if you know, I, I've been at Red Hat for almost 17 years. Um, I've done mainly in that time, I do security products, SE Linux I'm fairly famous for. Uh, but I've been doing container technologies actually all the way back to RHEL 5, 2005 uh, timeframe. So uh, when the sort of the uh, revolution started a few years ago, um, I got picked to start looking at it at the low level on the operating system. I now work for the OpenShift organization, but in my group are people that work on RHEL, work on storage, work all over. So we have a really a cross. And I'm an engineer, not a manager. So, um, anyways, this talk. Oh, with, hopefully this will work. Does anybody else have one of these? Okay, hopefully I'll, I'll be running back and forth. So as uh, Diane said, last night uh, about uh, five o'clock, I got a note saying, um, from management saying that we should attend this meeting after close of the stock market at four o'clock yesterday. Um, and I noticed that the email went to me and most of the people on my team, even though we're cross. So I said, there's something going on here. Um, that I didn't know anything about, but basically uh, Red Hat and CoreOS um, just decided to join forces together, um, and um, there's very little I can answer for questions. I'm not sure what this all means. I have some ideas, but you know we haven't even really talked to the CoreOS guys other than tweeting to them and saying welcome to Red Hat. Um, but one of the things when I've done this presentation in the past, I've often talked about the contributions of, of CoreOS to the um, uh, to the container environment, and now I can put their logo on the slides, so I'll, I'll show you where they've contributed um, greatly. Is that working? Awesome. Thank you very much. You're the man. Okay, so when I've given this presentation, I've been given a, a version of this presentation back at the Red Hat Summit, um, and one of the things I'd like to uh, talk about in the beginning is those three letters. What do those three letters mean to you in this room? When you see something that ends in .pdf, what does it mean to you? I believe it means to you that you know you can look at it, right? It's a document. You see it, you know it's a document, you can view it. What can you view it in? All the web browsers. You can view it in different tools. You can use it just about anywhere. How can you create PDFs? There's lots of tools to create PDFs, right? You can create it from the web browser, from your emailer, there's tools that allow you to create special PDFs. But when you see that PDF, do you instantaneously say Adobe? Do you think that the only way I could ever look at one of these is with the Adobe Reader? Do I think that the only way I could ever actually um, print it is from Adobe products? Right? It, it became a sort of a generic thing, and it's great, and it actually made Adobe stronger because it became everywhere, right? It became a standard. Linux. When you see the keyword Linux, right, you have to think of Red Hat? No, right? Linux is everywhere. It's in your cell phones, it's in your cars, it's on your you know, routers, it's on your IoT. Linux is everywhere. But if there was only one company that ever provided Linux, even if it was Red Hat, I don't believe Red Hat would be as successful as it is by not controlling it. It's a standard. People see the word Linux and they know it's a, an operating system that can run everywhere. Now we get to containers. All right? We have to make containers generic. We have to allow different ways of creating this. How many people in this room know what a container is? Okay. A con that, that's good. But let me give you my definition of what a container is. A container is simply a process on a Linux system that lives with some resource constraints. In Linux, we call those C groups. Secondly, it has some security constraints. It has things like maybe set comp rules. It has 
ownership, file ownership. It has capability, Linux capabilities associated. It has SE Linux, if you're running on an SE Linux, it has SE Linux labels on it. And thirdly, it has this concept of namespaces. So namespaces are things like the PID namespace where you sort of lose, you sort of get that feeling for virtualization. So I start to have uh, a virtual feel, like a network namespace where I have my own network device. Um, so if I booted up a RHEL 7 system right now, or a Fedora or Ubuntu system, and I looked at the first process that comes up on the system, and I looked at, uh, if I catted out proc slash one slash um, C groups, guess what? PID one is in a C group. If I went to proc one slash NS, I would see that PID one is in a namespaces. It's in a group of namespaces. If I looked at it and asked what the SE Linux label of it, it has an SE Linux label. If I looked at its capabilities, it has capabilities. So I would argue that every process on a Linux system is in a container. Okay, and then containers just become us modifying and manipulating those, those fields, right? I can modify the C group that it's in. I can change its resource constraints. I can change its SE Linux label. I can change the namespaces. But every process on the Linux system is. Now, I saw someone earlier had a, we have a shirt that Red Hat um, puts out all the time, and on the front it says Linux is containers, and um, on the back it says containers of Linux. And that's what it means, right? Actually, it's right here. You have the shirt on. Okay, so when you look at a Linux system, everything is a container. So if people come up to me and say, can I do this in a container? And I say, if you can do it on Linux, you can do it in a container. So let's contain it. So containers are just Linux. Okay, this might be a US thing, but do you guys know what a swear jar is? Okay, in the US, when you're raising kids, anytime they swear, they have to throw, in the US, would be a quarter. Some kind of coin has to go into the swear jar anytime you say a swear. So I've been asked by the D company not to use the D word anymore. So if I use the D word, I will throw, this is my swear jar here. I wish I had a better jar, but, so I'm gonna try like hell not to use the D word. So when OpenShift or Kubernetes comes along and they say, well, or when you wanna run, forget about OpenShift and Kubernetes, when you wanna run a container, what do you wanna, what does it mean? I wanna run a container on the box. Well, the first thing I do is I need to have a definition of what a container is. Well, what can a container image? Because usually you're not saying, you know, as I said, all processes are containers, but really what I want to say is I want to run the Engine, Nginx container, or I want to run the Fedora container, or I want to run an Apache container or an application container. So what does that mean when I say that? Well, we have to have a standard that defines what those containers are, okay? And, and I give them credit, I really can't do it without it, but Docker developed a standard uh, for that. They defined a standard that was basically um, an image format. And the image format is, this is real technical here, it's a tarball and a JSON file, okay? You create a rootfs, which basically looks like the slash of an operating system. You tar it up, and then you get some JSON data that you associate with that tarball, and the JSON data defines things like this is the entry point to my container. This is the environmental variables I want set when you uh, run a container. Um, this is, you know, Dan Walsh created it, so I'll put a maintainer flag in it. So that JSON file describes what's in the container. Now we have the concept of layered containers, or layered container images. And a layered container image is basically, I create that container, now I add new content to that rootfs. And I tire up that difference and I create a JSON file that's slightly different than the original one, and I tie both tarballs together and both JSONs together, and that's how I create a layered image. And if I want to add another layer, I keep on creating it. So I end up with a bunch of tarballs and a bunch of JSON files inside of a tarball, and that's what a standard image is. So CoreOS actually wanted to standardize on this. Several years ago, they decided they wanted to standardize on what that JSON file is in the format that went in those, and they created the AppC spec. AppC was a competitor against Docker image format. Okay, and so the world went wild. I was dead set against this at the time because I didn't want us to end up with RPM versus Debian, right, where for the last 20 some odd years, people have had a package software for Linux in two different formats. So we wanted a single format. And because um, CoreOS wanted to develop this standard for it, it forced 
the D company to come together and we formed a standards body that included companies like um, CoreOS, Red Hat, Microsoft, Google, IBM, and about four or five others. And we formed a, a company, an organization called the Open Container Initiative. And the first thing they did is they standardized on the OCI image format. Okay, and that got standardized last year about this time. So now I have a standard way of um, putting content into what I call a container image, or defining my software, packaging my software in container image. I can now take this container image and I can actually store it at a website. Okay, I can put this stuff out. Here's my application, I put it at a website. Okay, those websites are often called container registries. Okay, but really a container registry is just a website that has a whole bunch of these OCI image formats, files. So the next thing I need to do is how do I get that image off of the registry and copy to my host? So we, um, you know, how, how, do you how do you install an application? How do you pull an application on? Someone in the room tell me, how do you get containers onto your system? Anybody? You got a quarter? <laughs> okay. That's the only way. That's the only way to copy a tarball off of an HTML, off of a website to the host. We're four years into this. Four years into it, and that's the only way. Ain't that sad? It gets sadder. Okay, so we decided to pull the image stuff. Um, a little history, some of this talks back. A few years ago, we decided to create a product called Scopio. I'm going to talk about that at, that at the end. We wanted to be able to go out to a container registry and actually look at the JSON file. Remember I said there's a JSON file and a tarball? Well, those tarballs can get awfully big. I've heard rumors that some of our JBoss uh, container images are like 1.5 gigabytes. Right? So you're pulling this thing over. Well, what happens if you put, how do you want to look at that? If you just want to look at that JSON file and you want to copy it to your box, you have to copy 1.5 gigabytes. You get it down in your box, and, oh, that ain't what I wanted. Let me destroy it, right? So we wanted to add something to uh, de-inspect to allow us to look at the, just pull down the JSON file, don't pull down the entire image. Um, and we went to the D company and asked them to take a patch, the so de-inspect dash dash remote, and they said, ah, you don't need to do it, it's just a website, just build your own. So we built a tool called Scopio. So Scopio implemented the protocol, Scopio means uh, remote viewing um, in Greek, and what we did is we were able to remote, remotely view the image and figure out if you wanted to pull it down or not. Or if there was an update, maybe you had an image locally, see what's on the host and figure out if you want to pull images. So eventually the engineer that did that for me said, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just implement the entire protocol for pulling the image to the host. Eventually implemented it to push to the host. So we had Scopio. Scopio is probably our most, most used open source project from the tools I'm going to be talking about here. Lots and lots of companies are using it now to move images around. We'll talk about it more at the end. But we were working with CoreOS at the time, and they were interested in basically using it to pull into Rocket and using Rocket. But they said they didn't want to use the command line tool to do it. They wanted to develop a library, a Go library, to be able to do that. And so we created this thing called Containers Image. So GitHub Containers Image now has the entire protocol for moving images back and forth between container registries and local store. But it actually, we've added a whole bunch of additional functionality. You can actually move images from one container registry to another container registry using containers image. You can move containers images to your host into directory structure. You can actually move it into the Docker daemon directly. You can actually uh, move it into the thing I'm about to talk about. But basically, containers image becomes this protocol for moving images around, moving these tabballs around, and actually convert it. You can actually convert a V1 image into a OCI image and back and forth. It's really, really cool that we have this library now. So the next thing is, we talked about the container image as being this layered thing, right? It has um, two, three, four layers. And the way that you can create and uncreate these things is, is based on a layering or copy on write file system. So copy on write file systems are file systems that you can actually create a directory, write to it, and then you create another layer. You basically put some kind of storage over the original layer, and then you put another tarball, you know, untile the second tarball on it, and then you put another layer on top. Some of the layering file systems that have been developed over the last few years, uh, Device Mapper, 
There's ButterFS version. There's AUFS, which is only, which is Ubuntu only, um, and Overlay is now the most popular one. So all these, um, you know, Red Hat actually developed three of those. Um, we developed Overlay, uh, ButterFS, and Device Mapper. We contributed those upstream to the D project, and um, we decided to pull those out into a separate library. So we create a container storage. So now we have a library that can actually implement all the copy on writes you need to run a container image, to, to unpack a container image onto storage. So the last thing when you want to run a container on a system, so you pull the image, you know what an image is, you pull the image to the host, you untie it onto a system, now you need to run it. Well, the OCI also not only did an image format, but also defined what it means to run a container. Okay, and again, it's a JSON file in an exploded rootFS. So I have to have the rootFS on my disk, basically a directory that has something that looks like a root file system, and I have a JSON file associated with that. That JSON file defines things that the user adds to the original image and says, you know, I want to run this executable into it. So when you run a container runtime, it goes into the image, figures out what its JSON is, and then takes user input, combines those together, and creates the run C spec. Or the, uh, it's not the run C spec, it's the uh, OCI runtime spec. So we have the OCI runtime spec developed, and also um, the default implementation, which is called run C. So run C is a Go program for running containers. Every project right now that runs containers, pretty much in the whole world, is use, uh, runs open OCI containers, is actually using Run C. So if you download the D project and run it, it's executing the container as Run C. If you download um, Rocket, it's moving towards using Run C. If you download um, any of the products I'm going to be talking about from here on in, we're all using Run C. So we're using the same image format at the container registries, and we're using the same uh, runtime on, on the host, and all the runtime does is configures the kernel, configures those three things in the kernel, security, resource constraints, and the um, uh, namespaces to run a container. That's what Run C does. And we're going to be talking later on about other container runtimes that have been developed because it's a standard. Run C is the default implementation, but other people have been implementing these. Okay. Anything I just said, talk about containers demons, okay? All, everything I just talked about was all about things that you can do in an individual process, right? Pulling the image, writing to the disk, um, putting in storage, and running it. And yet, in the market, everybody's putting out demons. And they're getting fatter and fatter and fatter, okay? So I have a big push, I'm trying, trying to get trending that says, no big fat container demons. Okay? I want to stop all the proliferation of demons. If you run Kubernetes right now, so you own OpenShift and I say I want to run Kubernetes, the first thing it does is it talks to the Kubernetes daemon. Kubernetes daemon calls out to the Docker daemon. That's two demons. The Docker daemon then calls out to container D. That's three demons. Container D then goes out and talks to run C to run the container. Okay, so there's basically four different processes between. So when you run something, you're going through all these different processes. If anything goes wrong in any one of those steps, we end up with one of these going on. Okay, so I'm really down on this proliferation of demons, uh, although, guess what I'm going to do right now? Introduce a new demon. Okay, so now we talked about those four components, now let's look at Kubernetes and OpenShift. What happens when Kubernetes or OpenShift wants to run a container? Well, the first thing it does, first thing, well, again, let's take, take a step back. So Kubernetes was originally built totally around Docker. Sad. And it was totally embedded all the code into the, uh, into the program. And along came CoreOS, they wanted rocket support. So what did they do? They wrote the biggest patch in the universe to Kubernetes that basically did the equivalent of an if-then-else statement. So they said, if I'm running Rocket, do it this step, otherwise do the original code. And the Kubernetes developers said at that point, time out. If we do this for Rocket, someone else is going to come along and say, do the same thing. 
So Kubernetes turned it on its ear and said, instead of us taking in other container runtimes to run underneath Kubernetes, we're going to define a protocol called CRI, Container Runtime Interface. And they said, when Kubernetes wants to run it, it will call out to a <coughs> daemon and basically say, run this for me. It'll say, exec into this thing for me. Give me the stats on this. So they defined the protocol that they would talk. And what's happened then is CoreOS went back and with Rocket, it created Rocketetis, which was a cryo-based front end for Rocket. The D, uh, the D guys basically created a shim program that would talk to the daemon. Um, you know, the Docker shim program um, would basically um, also front end um, that daemon. Um, so all this became came possible about a year ago, or a year and a half ago. So Kubernetes tells the CRI that it wants to run a container. CRI needs to know what it means to be a container, so it uses the OCI standard for running a container. CRI pull, needs to be able to pull that image to the copy and write file system, so it needs to pull an image, and then it needs to execute it. That's what happens when I run a Kubernetes container. Seem very similar to the previous slides. So what my engineers, after we had done all this work, came to me about a year and a half ago and said, why don't we build a very lightweight tool to build and run containers? And that was called Cryo. So CRIO is the name of a daemon that we have created, a very lightweight daemon, not a big fat daemon, that's my excuse, um, that has scoped the Kubernetes CRI. It only supports users in Kubernetes and uses standard components for building blocks. Okay? Nothing more and nothing less. Does everybody know what version of the D word that Kubernetes currently supports? It supports 1.12. That's what we're shipping right now in RHEL. The problem was Docker was updating so fast and constantly breaking backwards compatibility that Kubernetes finally said, that's it. We're only supporting this. And currently, Kubernetes has just moved to 113, which came out about nine months ago. So we're kind of in a, a sticky place right now because we can't update to the latest things that um, the D command has because they keep on breaking backwards compatibility. There's been a lot of stability problems underneath Kubernetes to do this. As a matter of fact, even Docker has admitted this, and they're creating new products to be able to run Kubernetes, the thing called Cry Container D. So we wanted to basically say, we're going to build a lightweight container daemon that is totally dedicated to the Kubernetes workloads. Cryo. Cryo loves Kubernetes. All right? It is totally dedicated to Kubernetes. <coughs> Kubernetes is everything to us. Mesosphere, she's a cute chick. All right? We kind of liked her, but we're a one-woman man. So we don't do Mesosphere. Swarm. Not my favorite looking gal, but we're sticking with Kubernetes. The new chick on the block, not for us. Sticking to that. The old gal, not for us. All right. Cryo is all about Kubernetes. That's it. If Kubernetes says we need an interface that does this, we implement it in Cryo. We implement nothing else. So let's look at Cryo. Let's look a little deeper at Cryo. So Cryo not only takes advantage of that container storage and container's image in the OCI image bundle and the OCI runtime, but it actually has to create that JSON file on disk. So there's an open, part of the Open Containers Initiative, there's some libraries and tooling that was built to create that JSON, create the open runtime spec, and we take, use that tool in ours. OCI runtime tools library is used to generate OCI config. The next thing we use is the CNI. CNI was actually developed, again, by CoreOS. So CoreOS developed a standard way that everybody in the industry is sort of glommed onto for running containers. It is the default networking standard for running, um, net setting up networks in a Kubernetes environment, um, and Cryo is using it. So when you set up your networks, we will use uh, CNI for do it. It's been tested with different backends, so Flannel, Weave, OpenShift, SDN, and all the new container, you know, new uh, networking uh, tools that are coming out are all implementing CNI backends. Finally, we implemented, when you run containers, 
on the box, it just processes living on the box. So you need, usually need something that monitors it, okay, keeps track of it. Um, a lot of times the uh, um, um, D package, um, in the olden days when you stopped the Docker daemon, uh, when you restarted it, all the containers would go away because there's nothing, the only thing monitoring was the daemon. And so what you wanted is you need like little lightweight programs that just sit out there and run while the container is. And it listens to things like standard out and standard error of the container. And that's how you can manage your containers. So you have a monitoring program that does it. It used to be the daemons, um, but we built a very lightweight process that sits up there and just watches the container. So it monitors logging, it handles the TTY so you can connect back into the TTY and out, um, and, and basically detects if the, if the container dies. And if one process in the container dies, it, it'll finish off the container. And that's called CONMON. It's written in C, very lightweight, incredibly small memory footprint. So this is what a pod looks like inside a container. Does everybody know what a pod is? OK, about half the room. So Kubernetes doesn't run containers, it runs pods. Pods are one or more containers running in the same environment. So they share the same network, they share the same IPC, um, but they basically uh, run together. So um, you see up here that they're sharing IPC network namespace. PID namespace is op actually optional and they also run in the same C groups. Um, it's kind of a cool idea. Um, most people you know, still think in terms of containers, but pods are all about things like you might want to have a sidecar pod or a monitoring pod. So you might have a I mean, mon monitoring container. You might have your primary workload running inside of the container, and then you have a secondary container that watches it. Okay, some security companies are doing that now. Another idea I have is basically a lot of times containers come and they need really high privileges to sort of modify the kernel. Say an NVIDIA card comes and it wants to load a kernel module. Well, and then the container is going to actually use the, the container, a different container application is actually going to use, say, the, the, uh, you know, the special device for the special CPU device. Um, so you might want to have a sidecar container that's able to load kernel modules, but then the secondary container is locked down. So you have some interesting ideas with pods. But a pod in a cryo environment basically looks like this. So uh, in a Kubernetes environment, there's always this infra container or a pause container that really just holds open the, the, the network namespace. And then you have um, container A and optionally container B, and then you have Kanban. So when, every time um, cryo creates a container, it creates a, a pod that looks like this. And then we get up to a higher level, and this is what the whole architecture of cryo looks like. So we have the kubelet, which is part of Kubernetes, and that talks the, I'm trying to find the, the yeah, I'll do it by finger, uh, gRPC here. gRPC in this case is CRI. So it's actually, this is the protocol, it's called the gRPC, or that's a, a Go language RPC, but the, the protocol is actually a CRI, and that talks to cryo. Inside of cryo we have a library that's using containers image that we talked about at the beginning, we also have container storage, it also has CNI for setting up the network. It has that OCI generate so it can generate the runtime spec before launching run C or uh, some other kind of uh, runtime. And then it launches the runtime service um, and also has the image service with basically this is how we manage, manage the container storage, right? You know, what, contain, what images are currently on the box, what do we pull and things like that. And then you have the two pods. In this case, we're showing two pods running. Uh, we have pod one with two containers, two, and so we have the pods container plus the two others. That's the previous picture. And the other one is probably the most common way people run pods is they have one container running in it along with the pods container. That is the entire infrastructure. That's the entire thing of cryo. So cryo is actually a very thin, very lean. So let's talk a little bit about cryo status at this point. We came out with cryo back in um, a few months ago. Um, but oh, so one of the things about cryo if you want to commit, contribute to cryo, that's great. But in order to get anything merged into cryo, it has to pass our test suite. Our test suite is currently running over 500 Kubernetes tests on it. Our goal is that if you cannot pass the entire Kubernetes test suite, entire OpenShift test suite, you are not going to get your patch merged. So no PRs merge of that. That means that every time we get a patch in, it takes like hours, like one, two, three hours to actually pass the test. If you fail, you're out. So we shipped Cryo 1.0 um, back in the, uh, I think in the November timeframe. 
So the guys on my team wanted to have a 1.0. I wanted no part of 1.0, okay? Because it becomes, uh, it's a hassle to describe it. So we have 1.0, Cryo supports Kubernetes 1.7. Uh, currently that's in tech preview. So if you're running OpenShift on RHEL right now, you can actually set up Cryo to run underneath your uh, Kubernetes environment. Um, it's in tech preview, not supported, but you can play around with it. Later, we came out with 1.8. 1.8.4 is the current version. Notice we jumped from 1.0 to 1.8. From now on, Kubernetes and Cryo are going to have the same release number. So if you want to run Kubernetes 1.9, you will run Cryo 1.9. If you want to run 1.8, you will run Cryo 1.8. So when we get Kubernetes 1.10, anybody in the room tell me what version of Cryo you'll use with it? Anybody? Yeah, it's a slow crowd. Uh, so the idea is basically we don't want to have any confusion on it. Kubernetes 1.8 uh, is not something that OpenShift is going to ship. So OpenShift is actually skipping shipping of 1.8, except for online. So as of right now, Kubernetes 1.8 is being shipped on uh, OpenShift online. Origin right now is at 3. Dot, that's OpenShift version 3.8 supports Kubernetes 1.8, but you can't use it, you can't buy it from Red Hat. Cryo is running in OpenShift Online now. We'll talk about that and again in a second. 1.9 is, uh, Kubernetes 1.9 is in, uh, being released right now, so Cryo 1.9 is available. OpenShift 3.9, which is scheduled for springtime, will have full Cryo support built into it. Docker will be the default, and Cryo will be the alternative. The goal at OpenShift 3.10 is to flip it and make Cryo the default and the D word is the alternative. Okay, so that is scheduled, I think, sometime in the summertime. Maintainers and contributors to the Cryo project, Red Hat and Intel have been working very heavily on this. Lately, we've been getting a lot of contributions from Lyft. Suzy has been involved. Now I could probably put CoreOS up there uh, since they will be involved. Um, so these are the, the heavy maintainers of it. Cryo is now powering nodes on OpenShift Online. So basically, as of right now, if you get an OpenShift Online, you will be using Cryo. We are dark fooding it totally, and we are getting really, really good results with it. So one of our companies contacted us, and we um, heard rumors that they were using it. Um, they not, have not given us the liberty to... Uh, say who they are yet, but they, we asked them, why haven't you told anybody using Cryo in production? And this was their quote, was Cryo just works for them, so there's no reason to complain. And I think that is the perfect reason. That is the reason we built Cryo, right? We want Cryo to be containers in production gets to be boring, okay? It just works. And that is what our goal with Cryo is, to simplify and make it as simple as possible for running containers under Kubernetes. Kubernetes and OpenShift are complex enough. We don't need to make an adventure of running containers on the host. So everything we do, you know, Red Hat, the reason I get paid and my team gets paid is to make OpenShift successful. So OpenShift, one of the reasons we did Cryo is we wanted to make OpenShift more stable uh, running in the environment. But OpenShift actually has other features than just running Kubernetes. So, what else does OpenShift need? It needs the ability to build container images. It needs the ability to push container images to container registries, right? So anybody that's played with OpenShift, use source to image, or you can, uh, uh, you know, basically you want to be able to build containers as well um, as that. So this guy's Nile and Dieby. One year ago this week, uh, we come out to DevConf. DevConf is a big developer conference out in Brno, Czech Republic. And we were talking about container storage and containers image at that point. And I turned to him and I said, you know, what I really need is a core utilities package for building containers, right? If I can build a tarball in a JSON file, I want to build them together. And he said, well, what, what should we call them? I said, well, just call it builder, okay? So he came out and said, builder. And if you know, I happen to have a slight Boston accent, but... So he created Builder. Now I'm going to ruin everybody's picture of our icon right here. That's a, that's a, uh, a Boston Terrier in there, because so, it's the accent, making fun of the Boston accent. Uh, but what, what's he wearing on his head? 
The first thing when this icon went out, someone had said, why do you have a dog wearing tidy whities on his head? <laughs> so the, the newer icon actually is more of a hot hat, but uh, I, I keep that one just for that joke. Okay, so Builder was, the goal with Builder was to make, you know, again, looking at container technology, how do you build containers? Someone shouted out in the room, how do you build containers now? Container images. Debuilt. Okay. Can someone name another way to build container images? S to Y. And what does S to Y use under the covers? It uses Debuilt. Okay. Here we are, four years into the container revolution, and the only way to create a tarball and a JSON file is with the D word. Don't we suck? Isn't that horrible? Right? I could tar up, I can do that by a shell script. So I wanted is a series of tools to be able to do that. So we wanted core utilities for building container images with a simple interface. So the builder command actually has builder from, because you want to be able to somehow specify that I want to get a container off a container registry and pull it. So if I wanted to build from a container image, I could do builder from Fedora and it creates a container. And then I can mount the container onto my host. All right, from that point on, I can just interact with that mount point on the host. Segway. Has anybody ever used this command? Okay. This command allows you to copy content into a container image, and it allows you to take content in a container image and copy it out to your host. Okay, they had to build a tool to do that. Now, wait till you see the tools I've built. I built this tool called Copy. Okay, I put it in the core utils package. So you were able to use this copy command to actually copy content in and out of containers. And how do you do it? You just say copy dash r source directory into the container. Pretty cool. I didn't stop there though. Wait, 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 you see this? I created this tool called DNF, or yum for those guys. So it used to be called yum. I changed the name to DNF, and now I'm gonna change it back to yum because I'm schizophrenic. Uh, so I can use DNF and a, I added a flag to it called install root, and I can actually point to the directory, and I can actually install content into the directory, into the rootfs directory. But I didn't stop there. I created a tool called make. <laughs> yeah, it's a make tool. It actually, you know, it's, it's fairly popular in the C community, and I can actually do a make install with a dester pointed to a directory, and I can actually install directly into the directory. Okay? So I have lots and lots of tools that I've built over the years to be able to you know, move data into a directory. One of the cool things here is when I create this container, I need to add some stuff to, remember I talked about the OCI, that JSON file? So we have a builder config that actually can create a, you know, entry points, environmental variables, set all the flags to put inside the container, and then I can commit it to create a container image. So I take the container, when I'm happy with it, I create a container image, and finally, I push it somewhere. And guess what? I can push it anywhere. I can push it to um, Docker I.O. I can push it to any container registry. I guess that costs me money. Um, so I can actually do all this stuff with, uh, you know, moving content around. Really simple. But really cool thing about this, when you run container images that are built with dbuilt, what's the problem with them? They come with not just Apache, or not just Nginx, there's a, pro, I mean, it's a benefit and a cost, but it comes with DNF inside of it. It comes with, if you wanted to run a make inside of it, you have to have make in there, you have to have GCC. When you run the container images in the world, they're coming with all the build artifacts required to build them. So I always often work with security people that say, I need to get all that stuff out of there. I don't want a hacker getting in and having access to all these tools when he logs onto a machine. So they want small images. Everybody's after small images. And yet, the only way we build images right now is to stick every build tool in the universe in there. Python gets stuck in every single container. If you run an Apache, you have to have Python in there. Why? Because DNF uses Python. Do you need DNF in there? No. The way you're supposed to update container images is not go into the container and do a DNF yum update, or a DNF or a yum update. What you're supposed to do is replace the image. So this tooling actually allows you to build a minimum image allows you to build container images with very minimal. And so you say to me, Dan, wait. What about Dockerfile? 
I actually went to the concierge today and asked them to change a five uh, pound note into coins. He brought me back five notes. And I said, no, no, I need a lot of little change. <laughs> And he looked at me like, strange, he gave me a big handful of change. So what about dfile? So B, builder supports the dfile command, and we call it builder build using dfile-f. Basically follows the same syntax as you know, dbuild. But we're lazy. Right? Engineers are lazy, so we actually have build a bud. Okay, and Anheuser-Busch has not approved the name, but we're going to go with it for now. So you can actually build containers using, with, using the traditional method for building containers. Everybody read that line? I should have made you read the last one. Someone read the line. This is supposed to be an interactive part of the talk. <laughs> what about other formats? I wrote a brand new tool called Bash. Okay, I built shell scripting. And the way you build, build the containers is you can use dfile or you can use bash, either one of the tools. Okay? We're not going to build a builder file. Right? There's not going to be some special language for doing this. The goal is basically use the standard tools that you have available on the Linux system to build tarballs with JSON files. But if we want to use higher level tools like source to image, We're working to make OpenShift use Builder for sourced image containers rather than using the D word. We also want to work with OpenShift I mean, with Ansible containers. So if you want to specify in an Ansible playbook how you want your container, what you want in the contents of the container, we are going to work with Ansible containers to pull. They're currently using the D word underneath it. Builder has become a lot of people are looking at Builder, and what they really want to do is they want to actually run builds inside of Kubernetes. So I wanted to run distributed build systems, things like that. Builder has a lot of features, a lot of simple simplification. Currently, when people do this, they're call, call, always linking the Docker socket into the container, which gives you full root access on the host as soon as you do. So if you want to run a system, Builder might be a simpler tool for running in, say, a large Kubernetes environment. Um, Builder has some sh shortcomings and positives over speed of building. But basically, if you're building Builder containers, in a production environment, a work stream is actually going to work faster than dbuild. Um, so that's builder. So what else does OpenShift need? Well, you need a way to debug this thing. Okay? Currently, in an OpenShift environment with the D word running, if something goes wrong in the host, what do you do? You SSH onto the box, and you start running D commands. Okay, so I start doing things like, let me look to see what images are installed. Let me look at what containers are running on the system. Okay, well, in cryo world, there's two tools that are going to be added. One of them is called CRICTL. CRICTL, I don't cover that, that closely in this, although we're about to start shipping it, is actually a test, originally was a test tool for testing your CRIs. So it implements the Kubernetes protocol and it can talk to the daemon and actually tell it stuff like, you know, show me the pods that are running, show me the stuff. So a lot of stuff you might want to do diagnosing, but outside of the container uh, uh, runtime. But what happens if the container runtime is hung up and you want to look behind it? Well, remember I talked about all the storage, all the stuff's happening on disk. It's not tied to Cryo. Builder is using the same database, the same storage that Cryo does. So everybody's able to use it together because I invented another thing called file system storage. Okay, and I created a thing called file system locks. You can put locks on file systems now, thanks to me. So what we're doing is we're basically allowing tools to work together without requiring a big fat container daemon that controls everything. You know, everybody, mother may I, may it, mother may I, may it, mother may I. So we needed a tool that actually works underneath the covers on the back storage. So we created a project called LivePod. We wanted to create a Go language library that allows us to manage pods. Okay, so we want to be able to separate it out from cryo, but basically just allow us to manage pods, and eventually that library is going to get hopefully sucked back into cryo and into um, builder and other tools. But secondary to that is we created a tool called Podman. Anybody ever hear of Kpod? So Kpodman was actually 
used to be called K-Pod, but we had to wait forever to legal and marketing and stuff, so they came out with Pod, Pod Manager, Podman. One of the things we wanted to do with Podman was actually implement the entire Docker CLI without a big fat container daemon. So we copied the exact CLI. So if you want to list the containers that are running on the system, it's Podman PS. If you want to run a container on the system, it's Podman run, dash TI Fedora sleep. If you want to exec into the container, if you want to list the images on the container system. So Podman is just about to release to Fedora um, we're looking to get this out into RHEL probably around the 3.9 time frame, so lining up with that. But basically you can do everything you want inside of a container, have that entry level experience using Podman that you get traditionally with the D command. So that's the goal with Podman to implement the entire stack. We're not implementing Swarm, we're not ent implementing Compose, all we're implementing is sort of the basic tools, um, but um, I don't have it listed here, but we probably have about 95% of everything you'd ever want to do with the D command is now implemented in Podman. So we talked in the beginning, I uh, mentioned Scopio, um, and I'm just going to follow up. Scopio is being used heavily with uh, OpenShift underneath the covers, managing containers' images, moving them around the environment. Um, you can do all these cool things with it. You can inspect. Remember I talked about its original goal was to inspect. Um, you can actually copy, um, you can, well, in this case we're copying um, off of a container registry and moving it to an atomic registry. You can copy from, and, you know, you can copy directly from Docker I.O. and um, into a directory. You can create OCI images. Um, you can delete images off of container registries. Um, basically, this tool allows you to basically work with container registries and it actually can work directly. So if you want to copy off of a, uh, container registry and push it directly into the Docker daemon, that's supported. If you want to copy it directly into uh, Cryo's database, that's supported. It works with Builder, it works with everything. Again, it's using containers image under the covers, the same library that's being used by Builder, Podman, uh, Cryo, and this. So they all can share the database, they all can share the content um, on the system. So Scopio, as I said, Scopio is being used all over the place. It's being used by Pivotal as a major contributor to it to, to run in their uh, uh, PaaS environments. Um, we're getting contributions from very strange companies, you know, that you don't no normally think of um, as running, but lots and lots of big industrial companies now are running containers in, in their environment and they need to be able to manage these container images, move them around, and Scopio tends to be the tool to do that. So everything I talked about um, in this talk is listed here. Um, so we have a whole bunch, everything's open source, fully open source, they're all up on GitHub. Um, there's CRIO, um, Builder, Scopio, LivePod's a little different if you want to play with Podman. Uh, we also sit on two different free nodes, so we sit on Cryo and Podman, and we have the sites. Any questions? Everybody's taking a picture, I'm sure they want to get me in this picture. <laughs> yes? What's this about image signing? What's this about image signing? So, um, uh, Red Hat and our partners inside of Containers Image developed what we call simple signing. There's a real problem in the world right now in that nobody does a real good job of signing images. Okay, so the people in the room might have heard of Notary. So Notary was the, the effort by Docker to basically create a capability of signing images. So people want to you know, have something like an RPM trust signature. We found that Notary was way, way too complex. Okay, and we found that almost no one was using it. Um, so what we wanted to do is go off and create our own signing um, capability. So we built what we call simple signing. It's basically GPG signatures. Uh, we allow you to sign images that exist on any container registry. We don't make you put in some kind of big specific container registry, run some specific daemon. Um, you can create image artifacts, signatures, and you can actually store these signatures on any web browser you want, local files. Um, we actually built it into OpenShift registry, so if you pull images off of OpenShift, we can actually do signatures on it. Um, and it actually works pretty well. The problem with signatures, though, right now, is that Kubernetes doesn't know about them. So we built it into our tools. All of our tools, Podman, Builder, Cryo, they all support signatures. So you can actually configure a system that basically says, I only trust images that come from this 
registry, or I only trust images that are signed by Dan Walsh. If you wanted to do that, not a good idea, but you know you might want to do that. Um, and you can set all this up, and what happens is Bill, uh, uh, Kubernetes comes down and says run a container, and then the container runtime you know, come in and say I want to run you know Nginx container, and it comes in and says wait a minute that's not signed by Dan Walsh, and it says it's not allowed, but the protocol doesn't go back up to Kubernetes. In both the notary case and simple signatures. So what does Kubernetes do? It says, you know, the, the container runtime says, I'm not running it. And Kubernetes says, no, you're going to run it. And then it says, no, I'm not. And you end up with like, you know, hugging with a five-year-old. And, and there's, no, there's no protocol built. So uh, lately, Kubernetes has started an effort called Graphius. And Graphius is, is looking at moving s signatures into the Kubernetes protocol. And we're looking to get our simple signing as being the default implementation. So we're trying to work with Google to basically say, we just need GPG signed keys. We don't need CAs. We don't need huge infrastructures for this. We just need the same stuff that we've been signing RPMs for forever. And hopefully, we'll be able to work with Kubernetes to get simple signing to get up a layer into Kubernetes. So Kubernetes will know, oh, this node is not allowed to run uh, images that are unsigned by Dan Walsh. So therefore, I won't push images that are unsigned to Dan Walsh to that image. So. So that's, that's why we're not pushing s signing to that degree yet, because it's not built into the Kubernetes protocol. How come it's not part of the OCR? Hmm? How come it's not part of the OCR? Because Docker has control. No, you would just cost me money. <laughs> because there's no way that, there's no way that company's going to allow simple signing to get in when they're trying to sell a thing called notary. Other questions? Yes. So, uh, in terms of user experience, if you look at Docker, right? Docker yeah. at least gives you a way common thing. So you do Docker run, you do a Docker, do a Docker pull. Right. You do Docker. If you look at this, these are like four or five different things now. Well, by the, the Podman, Podman gives you every single thing you just said. OK. so. It does, every one of those commands is underneath Podman. So if you need that experience, Podman's to do it. Even Pod, Podman has a Podman build that calls into Builder to do a Builder uh, bud. Um, so we have, for, for people that need that. But in the Kubernetes world, that doesn't make any sense. Those, those, those interfaces aren't necessary, OK? One of the big problems, one of the big advantages and one of the big problems with D is that it forces, it's a client-server operation. Okay, so you have to have this big friggin' daemon sitting out there for every application. When you run, say, say you want to just run a container in a, boot, in a systemd unit file that comes up, say I want to just run Apache at boot time. Okay, if you put uh, the, the DCLI into the systemd unit file, it actually is not, the, the container ends up not being a grandchild of systemd. It ends up being a different grandchild of systemd of a totally different parent. Okay, it ends up being a child of the Docker daemon. OK, so it's, it's kind of a weird situation that we built. Now, because they, they have a daemon, they can actually remount, allow remote access to the daemon over the network. And that's something we can't do with, with Podman. So there is a different experience there. But as a security guy, I'm not really into allowing this big, fat daemon that gives you full root access to my machine with no authorization. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of that. So. To my opinion is as soon as you go across machine, you really want to use something like OpenShift and Kubernetes. And, and a lot, because they built in authorization and authentication and all that stuff that the, you know, that Docker has never built into their, their tooling. So, yeah, while we talk about different, but I'm really talking about different use cases. And, and, and Docker is actually moving away from that also. So, Docker does not, in the future, as of the, the, uh, Conference, their conference this past spring, they actually announced, um, they, they've taken a look at Cryo and said, you know, there's some good ideas going there. And so they took that, remember I talked about this container D thing? So the original one, you would talk to the D daemon, and the D daemon would do the pulling of images and would put them into their storage, and then would talk to the container D daemon to actually launch the containers. The reason they did that is they wanted Swarm to have better performance. If you're going through the, the D daemon, your performance it tends to be bad because you're going through this layer and it's a really complex daemon. And so they wanted to basically have Swarm talk directly to Container D so they could get rid of that bottleneck. 
but Container D originally didn't do anything about pulling images or, or storing images. That hap ha still happened to the Docker daemon. After they saw us doing all this work, they actually moved the code into the crowd daemon, I mean, into the uh, Container D daemon. Uh, one of the problems, though, is so, you know, uh, Docker, the company, is being a little schizophrenic right now because they still want Swarm and they want Mesosphere and they want Kubernetes. And so they're, they're constantly chasing after what Cryo is doing, but they're doing it with, in my, fa my feelings, a very big container daemon that, you know, I'm not, inter I'm not interested in supporting those. If those guys want to build daemons to support Mesosphere, there should be a separate Mesosphere container daemon that just, you know, implements whatever Mesosphere needs, not, not merge them all together into one big daemon. Anybody else? I'm going to stop you. Okay, I've gone way over, but. You've gone way over, that's all right. Um, well, we're going to have an AMA. Yeah, I'll, I'll be around. I'll be around all day, and I, there is a session. You guys can ask more questions there. So thanks for having them. Listen to me, and uh, if you've got a favorite charity, I'll donate it. Yeah, you have the favorite charity? Sorry. We have, uh,